<laughs> well, hello. For our not regular Thursday <laughs> lunchtime, <laughs> normally would be Wednesday afternoon, um, sessions uh, of the Pure Talks. And this is the season finale. Who knew that we would have a season and that well, this would be the finale? At the beginning of lockdown, didn't know this was going to be a thing. Mm -hmm and didn't know that we were going to have a beginning a middle or an end so yeah this has been exciting and i'm just so grateful for everybody who's kind of come on the journey with us of all the learning and we have learned and it therefore is absolutely appropriate and apt for the final season's finale show to have a resilience coach with us hello justin Hello to you, Leslie, and hello everyone else who is watching. Yeah, so we're on, hopefully, live streaming onto Facebook. So anyone who's got questions on Facebook, and we, and we <laughs> do this now because after last week's, like the whole of um, half of America went down and we went down with them. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. Like a... So, uh, yeah, this week. We're so very happy that that hasn't happened. And I think it's live streaming and um, my able assistant behind the screen will tell me, I'm sure in a minute if that's all. Yeah, I got a thumbs up. Marvelous. So that's all streaming. So I will keep an eye on Facebook as we're chatting. So if anyone's watching us on Facebook, please add your questions. Um, or you can hop over and join us on Crowdcast because I put a link in there. So anyone who's over there on Facebook is happy, you know, pop over and join us on um, Crowdcast you can join us live and then you can ask your questions. Anyone who's watching us on Crowdcast now, don't forget to add your ask a question in the ask a question box and we'll do those towards the end. So, Mr. McCarran, lovely to have you. Lovely to have you here with me today. Very nice to be here virtually with you. Virtually, yeah. And it's so weird, isn't it? It's like, yeah. you know, I've had to get used to this with my business and with doing these broadcasts, which I always thought were going to be podcasts and then became real life broadcast things. Mm -hmm. And yesterday I did actually spend a day doing a photo shoot and seeing a client in real time, socially distanced with masks and everything. But that's pretty much, you know, I've had one or two experiences like that over the last four months, but that was about it. Yeah. So that was a bit weird. That was a bit weird. This now feels completely normal. Well, it, this is just straight in with the theme of it's extraordinary how quickly we adapt to changes in our circumstances. Humans were amazing at it. And that's a lovely example of how quickly, you know, we hear this phrase all the time, don't we, the new normal, but how quickly we adapt to things and get used to them and stop noticing them. Absolutely. We should notice, shouldn't we? And I, yeah. that's why having a season finale is quite a nice thing because you mm. get to notice and look back. And we don't yeah. notice how far we've come until we stop, reflect and look back. Mm -hmm. And I cannot quite believe it. It's been such an actually in relative, you know, life, shut such a short period of time, actually, yeah. Yeah. really. Um, but we've come so far and I do that with my clients. And I say, you know, wow, you know, I've been working with you for a year or five years or whatever, you know, because obviously I'm working with artists professionally developing them. So it goes on a long time. Mm. You've, you're, you're a different human now. Mm. I think we need to reflect on that. And mm. Yeah. So you're a resilience coach, but you were, you're also a performer. Yeah. I'd be really interested to hear how your journey started, how that all kind of came together. What led you to here? Because we're saying, you know, this moment, this COVID led mm. us to this moment. Yeah. What led Justin from you know, young lad being asked by his parents, what do you want to do for a living? <laughs> As they used to ask us back in the time. Yeah. What do you want to do when you grow up? And we would go, I don't know. <laughs> go, yeah. and see a, go and see a careers coach who said to me, you need to be a secretary. And I was like, okay, I'm never speaking to you again. Don't ever <laughs> ask me. Don't ever ask me to do a typing lesson because that's not happening. <laughs> We're not yeah. doing that. Yeah. Um, what happened? Did, you know, what did you think about wanting to be when you were growing up? And what was your experience with careers? And then how did you get to here? You know, tell, tell us. Well, the, the arc begins uh, when I'm five years old and I'm in Dublin. And in Ireland, um, where I grew up, if for those who don't know, uh, parents are saddled with three months school holidays. 
So we finished right in the beginning of June. We don't go back till the beginning of September. So three months. So I'm one of four. So of course my my mom, who was who had made the choice to stay at home and and uh, drag us up, um, she had of course this whole range of activities that she'd organised over the summer holidays. Um, so we did everything from crafts to sports, uh, and one of the things we did was drama. So we would do these week-long activity courses, and I did this week-long activity course in drama, and uh, apparently demonstrated a natural um, affinity or talent for it, to the point where at the end of this week, there was a little award ceremony. And there were various things, you know, awards for best costume or best blah, blah, blah. And I was given the award for sort of like best newcomer, I suppose, the equivalent's like, uh, you know, person showing most promise. And the award was a scholarship to go to the weekly classes um, run by this woman who, anyone who's from Ireland will know the Betty Ann Norton School of Speech and Drama. The Betty Ann Norton School of Speech and Drama. (laughs) And elocution. So I, I'm I got this. That some of my Irish friends will be watching this, and we'll go. Oh yes, I they'll know go. That. Oh Betty, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> oh Betty, I know. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. And the story goes anyway that um, I I walked up to accept this award, and uh, and I was like, where's my prize? Because it was just an envelope, and I was l- kind of looking around, looking completely unimpressed because I was going, well, everyone else has got like you know a book or a medal, or, and I've got an envelope, and this is supposed to be the, the height of success. So anyway, um, that was it. There you go. That's where it started. It was started with me discovering a love of acting. And that is, um, so when it came to what you want to do, it was pretty obvious because I'd already been doing it for all of my, you know, childhood and teenage years. And I started working in Dublin. Uh, I did loads of ads and bits of television. So it was kind of really obvious to everyone that that is definitely what I was going to do. Um, I did go through the process of school and exams and thinking about universities but that was kind of yeah it was no surprise to anyone um when i said i'm going to england to be an actor that's interesting isn't it because we were just um just prior to coming on screen i was discussing the fact that i do disc profiling with you Mm. and asking you which um test you use and you said you use ocean Mm. and we were saying you know isn't it intriguing that you're told you're good at something and you live the rest of your life by that. <laughs> yeah. Which is effectively what's happened. Yeah. Well, I got, that's so funny you say that because I got to 25 um, and I suddenly thought, well, it's, why am, whoa, hang on. I, wh- wh- how did I get here? Stop. And um, I actually decided to, I had a sort of, you know, um, come to Jesus conversation with myself, <laughs> you know, um, and I gave everything up. I, I, became, I, was, I'm a little, I had a tendency to be a little bit extreme, so I decided I was going to go to India and find myself. So I gave away all of my worldly possessions, uh, destroyed all of my you know, acting yes. paraphernalia and books and everything, had all my teeth done. This was the big advice from my friends. Is that if, they all said, look, if you're going to India, indefinitely, you need to get your teeth sorted out now because the last <laughs> thing you want to do. And it was because I went to get my teeth sorted out um, that I discovered, I had four wisdom teeth taken out in an operation, and the surgeon was so worried about me because he thought I looked like I was about to pass out. Um, he took a blood test, and I got an infection. I went back, and he went, "Oh, I'm glad I've seen you. You're extremely anemic. Uh, you, you know, you're really unhealthy. So, like, the last thing you need to do is get on a plane <laughs> to India by yourself." Yeah. You need the last to, thing you need to worry about is your teeth right now. <laughs> yeah. And so because I'd given everything up and I'd left my flat, I had, I, I went back to Dublin, to Ireland, to my family for Christmas. And then kind of realised I had, I had to stay there because I couldn't go to India and I, I couldn't go anywhere. So I cancelled everything, visas and flights and all, and stayed in Ireland. And then over that six months, realised that thankfully, actually acting was what I wanted to do. So I, that's, so I kind of got back into it then in my mid-twenties going, you know, this really is what I want to do. It wasn't just because I was following the easiest path and I was told I was good at it. It turns out I, I actually do want to do it as well. So, so uni- the universe actually gave you a very hard kick in the teeth and went, look, Come on. they may have told you 
but it was actually good advice. It was actually, yeah. It was actually good advice, yeah. Yeah. So, so you um, went back to Ireland. So oh. that, you know, you come from Ireland, you come over to the UK. Mm. What made you come to the... Why did you think, I have to be an actor and I have to leave Ireland and come to the UK? Well, I think it's, you know, again, we're probably back to preferences. I just had a natural desire to travel and to get away from Ireland. So even when, when I was 12, I, I volunteered to go to, to do a French exchange um, with this random kid from France who wrote to my school. I went to a very nice Catholic school and his nice Catholic parents wrote to my school and said, is there any nice young Catholic boys who we could do an exchange with? And I remember being at the front of the class, not because I was particularly bright, and they, they came in and read this thing out and I shot my hand up and I looked around and no one else had their hand <laughs> up. And I was like, oh, okay. Awkward. <laughs> Awkward. Um, and yeah, so I just had this natural desire to just go out and, and explore. And Ireland at the time is not the Ireland that we know now, particularly Dublin. No. Dublin, you know, in the, in the 70s and 80s was really quite depressing. There was nothing going on. It was really poor. The, what, all it had going for it was an amazing music scene and an amazing um, art scene. So mm -hmm. theatre was brilliant, but it was very parochial. So you, you had lots of the same faces. And I just thought I, that's going to be my life. I don't really want that to be my life. I want to have broader horizons. So I chipped off to England. And in the meantime, the Celtic Tiger woke up. And by the time I turned around and looked back at Ireland, it had transformed and I'd missed the boat. So I kind of was like, well, I'm done. I, you know, uh, it had transformed so much that when I tried to come back, I thought I just don't fit in anymore. So that was it. I was, I was gone for good. So you came up. Oh. Sorry, my phone is ringing. Someone's decided to call us in the middle of oh. in the middle of a crowdcast. It does happen because they're obviously not used to us doing Thursdays. Yeah. <laughs> on silent now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, interesting. So you came, so you went back, and then you came back to England. Once you yeah. realised the universe went, no, you're not meant to go to India and find your inner book yeah. or self or whatever. Or yeah. Have your teeth extracted. You are actually meant to be a performer. That was a good idea. We yeah. have to listen to that, don't we? We have to listen to the universe sometimes. Yeah. Well, so this you is came a... back to England. Yeah. Well, I came back to England and I, so then I had a, a period of a good 10 years of just finally just going for it um, as an actor, just allowing myself to enjoy that. And I worked as an actor and I did a lot of music as well. So I, I play a musician as well. Um, so I did that for a good, a good long time. Where and you, in London or? I was kind of all over the place. So I was West Country, Bristol for a bit, and then I was in London and I was in France as well for four years, mm. uh, back in France, um, because I met and fell in love with a, um, uh, Hang on, Leslie, isn't it some bloke trying to tell you to use <laughs> Zoom on your phone? <laughs> Vincent, honestly, you are hilarious. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> no, so it wasn't actually. Say, say it no was more. actually it was actually a photographer who I'm working with on a community project. So it's a very good call. Um, yeah. and I will go back to him afterwards, Vincent. That's it wasn't funny. it wasn't um Tutor Jack. Tutor it Jack wasn't doesn't seem Tutor to be Jack. with us today, but I'm sure yeah. he might arrive later. He might so keep we'll keep an eye out for Tutor I Jack. I think we'll know if he's here. We'll know if he's here. That's so for sure. You're yeah. travelling all over. Your, you know, the universe has given you a little bit of a punch. Gone. No, no. Get back in your lane. Mm. You're in your lane. Get back in your lane. You try to get out, um, and you're travelling all over. You're back in the UK. What happened then? Well, you know, it's like these these things creep up on you, don't they? So um, I started. At back, say about 20, 25 years ago, there was a big development in the training industry. Um, you're too young to remember this, Leslie, Clearly, of course. Clearly, I um, am only 10. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, the, the development was they started bringing actors in to training to make it interactive. Um, I so suddenly you'd have. Do remember that. Do you remember that? You suddenly have role playing, was a, suddenly became a thing because they realised that making. A non actors role play with colleagues was just basically a form of torture. It was, uh, it was just so cruel. So they thought, well, why not bring in the professionals? And so they, I started to do that as an actor. And I, I ended up spending lots of time in training rooms, mm. sitting at the back um, in the classic actor. Uh, this, this is the actor's joke is how many actors does it take to change a light bulb? 10. One to change the light bulb, and nine to go, I could have done that better. Yeah. So, you know, an actor, there I am sitting in the back of the room going, I could do that better. Because, of course, what you had then was a generation of trainers 
um, who came from an academic background. So they had degrees in psychology or business studies mm. or um, experience as an HR professional, but they didn't have the communication skills that we, so they had the, the what, but not the how. So I thought, well, you know, I've got, I've got the how, so all I need to do is find the what, and then I can come, that is an interesting combination. So that's when I started to get into um, training work, communication skills training, development, um, uh, coaching, and all that sort of thing. And slowly then the volume on that turned up and the volume on acting turned down. And mm. it was a kind of gradual process. Um, and then I, re I was became a full-time um, actor facilitator was the term, and then uh, trainer coach. And I remember that when I was, at Coca when I was working at Coca-Cola doing uh, marketing and trade um, trading, yeah. And, um, we were doing training of the sales team and yeah. I do remember being in a meeting room when someone went, oh, there's this thing where you can bring in these actors and I do remember it happening. And yeah. going, oh, wow, that's interesting. And and it was great because other than the, prior to that, you'd been sitting through these presentations where you'd been... I know, brutal. <laughs> and your head had been bobbing and you, you know, trying to stay awake while somebody who is just giving you slide after slide of figures and yeah. all of a sudden you've got these dynamic um present because these were creative people they're in marketing yeah they were creatives but they were being you know i just want the science and the figures and there's no there's no passion and and it's soulless like that and the minute yeah. that happened the whole thing kind of pivoted it was at the point where we were just having the war with Pepsi and all of a sudden we were all like you know galvanized we all went out on the road and we were you know kind of really excited because we had this experience being trained by people who were exciting yeah actors yeah. are you know exciting people and they and they bring a lot of enthusiasm to the uh, to the arena and it really did change I think that you know you could not lightly say that you know they had quite an impact on that business as a result so yeah no yeah. I do remember the the phase and, well, and I, I went know, to work when I was 12, so, you know, I was of, only very young at that point. Of course, of course. Well, <laughs> I, well I can tell you that, um, you know, that has, I, wor I worked for Coca-Cola not that long ago, so they Did are, you? yeah, they're, yeah, for most businesses now, uh, private and public sector, bringing in um, uh, people with performance skills is almost, it's almost, uh, you know, default, you know, if yeah. you've got leaders who need to make a presentation it's like well who do you get to coach them you get people who have those communication skills actors and performers who also understand now the nature of business you know and don't don't turn up in you know scruffy track suit and uh, you know they are they, they turn up looking like business people and they've got, we've, got, we've got credibility now uh, we recognize you you are our people you're in our tribe because you've decided yeah. to dress like us <laughs> yeah yeah and of Although course that thing kind of gone the other way haven't they so everyone in the offices are kind of doing dress down so you probably yeah you know it's a bit of a meet in the middle well that it's very funny because um i don't do a huge amount of this work anymore but say going back about five or six years ago you would always part of the brief would always be what's the dress code because you you really want to get that right and you know you turn up all suited and booted and everyone's sitting around in t-shirts and hoodies and beards you feel like a right Egypt you know um, but the same goes the other way around so there was a kind of for for guys it was pretty straightforward because you're either in a in a suit and tie or you're in trousers and a shirt that's kind of it but I, I remember my female colleagues finding it this this grading of smart to casual just being really a real minefield for them is. you know I always is, ask, is it jeans or no jeans yeah the that's jeans nice no isn't jeans. it jeans or no jeans yeah 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 give so, me a jeans yeah. or no jeans answer and then i'll kind of know where i'm hitting the mark but it's really important yeah. to fit yeah. in that's a really important thing isn't it for us as humans to feel that we're part of the group with that yeah we're herd animals aren't we so we yeah. really feel like we fit in and if you don't feel like you fit in it's very jarring and and then you can't be your best you can't do your best because you're already feeling kind of out of your comfort zone and and you're there to do a good job so you want to feel you know like you fit in and that's a really important thing like if someone's going for an interview or you're going especially for, for artists you know if they're going to meet a gallery it's really good to do a little bit of a recce first and kind of st stalk their Instagram and stalk their social media and just see what they wear and how they look and how they behave because then you can get in rapport with them before you get there. So that's yeah. one less thing to have to worry about.
That's exactly always my point when, when, when people say, well, why should I change how I, I look? You, you say, well, because, because the window of opportunity that you have, particularly in first impressions, is so slight that really it's just in your own best interest to eliminate any possible uh, filters or blockers. And that filter or blocker of how we appear physically uh, is, is so strong that, look, if you can wear iron a shirt instead of a T-shirt or you know whatever that equivalent of that is for you well then actually it just makes sense you know because otherwise you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot on a on a principle you know um I, yeah i totally agree with you it's we, we you know our our need to be part of tribes is is instinctive um and you know and of course this is also we've stepped into the area of where unconscious bias and discrimination plays exactly. a huge part as well so uh, you know, we make these snap judgments on people all the time. So, but back to your point, if you if you accept the people, the person opposite you is going to make a snap judgment, you may as well do your best to encourage them in the right direction. You know, exactly. that's it takes just you common so sense. long, doesn't it? It takes you so long to get to the point of, of being in front of somebody, yeah. getting the opportunity. There's so much goes into that. It could be years of work to get yourself yeah. into the place for the opportunity. Why? fail at the last hurdle because you want to stick to this unconscious bias that I am who I am you know no one's yeah. asking you to change that they're just asking you to consider getting in rapport with the person ahead of the game really it's just yeah. giving you that like little bit of ahead of the game yeah it's those little it's those little micro signals isn't it micro messages that we send you know that we have control over actually mm. so you may as well send the right message exactly um, there's so much that we're not in control of there's so yeah. many things that you know you don't have control of. I, that you know, there's no point dwelling on that. That's out of your control. But if there are things that are in your control, then yeah, definitely, I'm a massive yeah. advocate for, you know, try and get as much like kind of insight before you go and take that next thing. So you set yourself up to win. Prepare. What is it? Um, fail to prepare, and you prepare to fail. Yeah. Well, there's a. I get you know, and this is where um, acting. There's a bit people in all walks of life can learn a lot from from actors because actors will prepare for a performance um and so the equivalent of the performance for some of the folks on the call might be you know a, a pitch for a place in the gallery or might be uh, you know you might be meeting a client or you might be talking to a colleague or you know it's going it's for a, putting yourself forward it, it can even be in the context of submitting something online to yeah for an open call where you might be selected for something and again you want to get the best images you possibly can and you want yeah. to make sure your statement think about the person who's going to be reading your statement and make sure that that's um, been you know you don't have one statement fits all you have to kind of tweak it depending on the audience that you're yeah. talking to yeah mm. Completely. And, and the principle that actors are used to, this notion of preparing and rehearsing, is really applicable. Uh, you know, when I work with people who manage other people, and by I say managing other people, I don't mean they have to be their line manager. It means you have a relationship with someone else. You're managing them to a degree. Uh, and, and, you know, I would say if, if a conversation is important, but we don't we think about what we're going to say, but we don't think about how we're going to say it. We don't think about the person who's receiving it, what might be going on for them. We don't think about the context. And then it all falls apart and we go, oh, well, it was, you know, that was a disaster. But actually, a lot of the stuff is avoidable by, by thinking about it in advance and preparing, said, doing the right preparation. Exactly, you know? context. Yeah. You have to think about that word context. And, you know, you hear that banded about, don't you, the word context. Yeah. But actually, it's incredibly important. What's the context? So now look around the edges and think about how you can get yourself in a position where in that context you are going to be maximum effectiveness. Now, you can't win everything. You can't get into everything, but you can give yourself yeah. the best possible chance. Like you, say, yeah. you know, I love the rehearsal, you know, concept of rehearsal. Yeah. Well, it's just reminded me that, that I, I, forgive me if I'm going to misquote this equation, you're probably familiar, familiar with it, that behavior is, uh, the, the, the equation is behavior equals personality times context. Mm -hmm. So it is that important. So who yes. you are, uh, the context in which you are, you know, communicating with another human being has a massive influence on on you and on your ability to connect. 
Yeah, uh, so we saying, underestimate that massively, you know. Yeah, we were saying about these personality tests and the importance of under awareness. And I think we're in yeah. an age now um, where we're much more enlightened about who we are and mm. what flexibility we have within our personality. And I know, as I say, the DISC one that I do um, um, is a DISC. So you're born mm. with a set of tendencies, but you, dependent on the context can mix up certain attributes and mix down certain attributes so that you can be maximum effectiveness in the context. Mm. And I know, as I say, you use Ocean. I was going to just put these, I'm just going to share the screen so people know what we are talking about. So I'm going to share the screen, first of all, with the disc um, one, and then I'll show you the, um, so let's have a look, disc there. So I'm going to show, I'm going to share the screen with that one. So this is disc. Um, so everyone who's watching can see and this um, gives you an idea of whether you're generally a task orientated person or generally a people orientated program and then it gives you degrees of your tendencies based on um, dominance so whether you're quite direct um, influence whether you're you are an optimistic um, influential person uh, compliance, whether you like to be, you know, the, the risk analysts in us, the compliance accurate, the accountants, and <laughs> steady. So sincere, patient, um, quiet, that's the quiet person, but they're quietly influential. So when you do a DISC um, analysis, it will tell you on a scale what your core tendencies are and then how you are behaving within the public context and within the private context. And it gives you opportunity to find out, oh, well, I've got like we were saying at the beginning, when you were told you were an actor. Um, oh, you're very good at drama. You're an actor. Yeah. Actually, that's just one aspect of your character. And these are just aspects of the, your character that once you understand them, you can dial them up or dial them down, depending on the context. So let's just have a quick look at the... So I'm going to take that one off and I'm going to share the screen now with the one that you were talking about. Maybe you can talk us through. Yeah. Which is Ocean. Because I haven't, I don't know this one. So this is Ocean. Um, I don't know this one. So I'd be really intrigued for you because this is the one that you prefer to use. Yeah. Well, so I like Ocean um, because I I use it in the context of if I'll notice. Sometimes it's helpful for people to uh, be aware of a tendency that they have. That they. So I was working with an artist recently, really fabulous um, artist. I'm a massive fan of her work and we had a conversation and she was struggling with certain aspects of her behavior um, and kind of worried about them and troubled by them and I was listening to her and, and I find found myself saying but what you're describing is is introversion mm -hmm. if that's what it is it's not something that's wrong with you you know, you're not a bad person or a weak person because you don't like these circumstances and you don't do well in these uh, kind of events. It's actually because, uh, unusually, she's quite an extreme introvert because, of course, most of us are am omniverts, uh, omniverts, you know, so we're sort of somewhere in the middle. But, and occasionally you'll meet an extreme extrovert and occasionally an extreme introvert. It's pretty rare that studies tell us. But she's actually quite far down the introversion route. And so I talked her through this and it was, you know, one of those lovely massive light bulb moments. She was like, oh, and of course, then she starts making her own connections going, oh, so that's why, and would this also be related to, and this whole sort of, um, this whole bunch of uh, problems she was having just fell apart, fell, fell apart in front of her because it was suddenly like, it's just as simple as that. It's just that that's your tendency, that's your preference. So, you know, as, a, as an introvert, her preference is for one-to-one -one conversations her preference is to have a lot of time together. So she was talking about, you know, having to pitch to do trade shows, for example. She said, I'm not going to do trade shows because I'm talking to lots and lots of people. And she was, she was saying, what's wrong with me? Because all my competitors are doing that. And, and it was like, no, actually. So then she decided she would set up her trade show with a series of one-to-one -one meetings. So that's, that awareness gave her a plan of action. Yeah. So anyway, that was an introduction to why I like, I like to use it, because I think I it's think easy to dip in and out of... That's incredible, isn't it? Because once people have an awareness of their, they're just yeah. a tendency. It's just That's like it. you had a tendency towards drama, the universe, and you decided, oh, 
maybe I'll try something. And the universe went, no, <laughs> get back yeah. over there. Um, and that's okay. But yeah. if it's not working for you, it's just a tendency. I have a tendency not to like to watch myself on a screen. And I have a tendency that I prefer one-to-one -one meetings. And everyone was saying to me, oh, you know, you could get reach so much, many more people if you would do groups and if you would do training online and everything. And prior to COVID, I was like, oh, no, I, I really, mm. that's not me. I like one-to-ones. But actually, when pushed, I actually really love this now. Mm. Because I've grown some resilience to yeah. it. I had to do it. I was forced to do it. And then I grew the resilience. So you now run a business called everyday resilience. resilience. I'm just going to show that. There's a link to it down at the bottom for mm -hmm. everyone to go and have a look if they'd like to. But I'm going to bring your, um, there we go. I'm going to bring your website up on screen here. And so that's the, what services you do. That's your service page. Yeah. And I loved these images. So you do obviously the, the lovely light kind of inner casual group meeting facilitating yeah. that and then coaching conversations and then the consulting which you've just been talking about but I was intrigued by this one partnership and collaboration because I'm all about partnership and collaboration I think yeah. you know, we get so much better further on when we collaborate and you co-founded Space on Sea yeah tell us about that because I love the sound of that so Space on Sea is an organization that I co-founded with uh, two friends. Called, one is called Kate Jaggers and one is Helen Edwards. And Kate, um, we just met as friends, um, but we met at a, in, a, at a period of, in a period of my life when I had made a conscious decision to change how I work. So I had decided that I was going to only put my energy into uh, people that I had a connection with. So that was my really simple principle. It was an experiment because uh, I'd had a, a big life change, um, which you know we might talk about in a moment. And part of the fallout of, of that was was kind of going, well, everything's changed, so I may as well just make a few more changes. Um, and I met Helen, and, and uh, Helen actually bought my old house, which is how I met her um, so two years ago. Um, and I and she had met Kate because she'd had to stay with Kate when she was looking for a house, because Kate runs uh, the hotel Ruby's Rooms on St. Leonard's oh, Seafront. And we were chatting and uh, we, we realized that there was this lovely connection. Um, Personality wise, uh, we got on, we make each other laugh, um, but also uh, our values and interests and, and the sort of people we wanted to work with are, are quite similar. So we set up this business, which is, part um it has a, a physical space which obviously we can't use at the moment but which is a training room which is the room in those photos which is a beautiful first floor room with windows overlooking the the uh, the english channel and that's housed within ruby's rooms the hotel so so the idea of the business is that businesses can come out out of for an out of town for an, an away day stroke weekend take over the whole hotel so there's we can accommodate to up, up to sort of 10 or 12 for a core team do the training in there and also we can organize you, you know if people are interested in uh, un unusual team building exercises so we've been talking with uh, for example wallpaper designer Deborah Burness to go and you know make her own wallpaper or the uh, the artist Mary Louise Miller to do a life drawing class or you know go and make your own um, poster or, or you know, find how to make pasta, all of these kind of different, using the local uh, designers, makers and artists and craftspeople, bringing them in to work with people in a creative way, in the, but, but in a business context, because that's, we are, we are all by nature, the three of us creatives, so it made sense. And the businesses we're working with tends to be businesses who are a bit more open to a creative process. So that was, the, that was what, um, uh, what, how it was born, and we just got set up and started talking to people and started running some courses, and then, of course, oh, um, wow. so that it, was just things crashed down. Prior just, to just yeah, and in fact, last night um, or the night before last, we ran our, our the virtual version 
of the physical workshop that we were going to be running um, uh, back in March. So the date was March the 22nd was the date we were supposed to be running. So that's obviously a pretty kind of critical date. Um, and initially, of course, we contacted everyone and we said, you know, should we just hold fire for a couple of weeks and, you know, maybe we can book something in for, I don't know, you know, May. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, last month we got in contact with everyone and said, look, it's not going to happen anytime soon. So would you like to do this re remotely? So we did the session. Um, we ran it remotely on, a, on Zoom on Tuesday night. And it was just it was lovely to to see that Space on Sea also, although it's in essence was a physically based business, it also has a presence beyond with in the absence of the physical um, space. And how did so. that feel doing it? Because I know, you know, when I'm doing with clients, it is very much about watching their body language and everyone, yeah. you know, there's the observer and there's the quiet one in the corner and then there's the, the mouthy one. And, you know, yeah. that, how did that work? Well, so, you know, I've, as you have as well, because we had this conversation, um, you know, prior to this, I'd have been uh, a bit of a Luddite um, you know, intentionally, in the real, true sense of the word, in that yeah. I've been a bit like, do you know what really matters is connection. People. You know, what really matters is being in the room with people. And, mm -hmm. you know, yes, I'll work with slide design and presentations, but it's about connection. So I'd spend a lot of time working with that. So I was kind of a bit dismissive about technology. Um, but I have discovered that actually technology works for to a, a great extent. Uh, there are limitations, but actually with the technology that's available now you can do a huge amount so i like to work with zoom and i like to work on with small groups on zoom um partly because uh with a small group you can see everyone's face yeah. so everyone's got their camera on so I, I think on the screen we can have up to 12 on a big screen mm -hmm. and also zoom has the lovely breakout room facility so i do lots and lots of that so we'll have a discussion like you and i are and then then we'll say off go off into your breakout rooms mm -hmm have a quick chat, come back. So it keeps the, it does, you kind of forget actually really quickly that you're, so it worked really well. Long way of saying it worked really well. No, I absolutely agree. I think Zoom is great and I use Zoom for all of my like one-to-ones or my yeah. group meetings when I'm doing um, Q and A's for the courses and such like, and I, I absolutely agree. You know, we're working in energy, aren't we? It's energy yeah. basically we're trading in. And, yeah. and you think that um, in your head that that has to be physical energy in the room. But I absolutely agree 100 percent. I don't want to give up the one to one face to face stuff, you know, for the long term. Mm. And it, it's nice when you do it, but you actually really appreciate it then when you do get in the room together. It's really valuable, yeah. that, you know, when you do actually have a one to one with someone in the physical space, because... I absolutely feel the energy flowing through this virtual space as well. Now I've grown that resilience to be able to cope with it. So why, and you know, getting back to, you know, why Hastings? How did you end up in Hastings? And is that relevant to you running your business going forward? Or is that just, you know, like we were saying about context, could it be, have been anywhere? I, I, I think con I think the context was uh, it was uh, the context was intentional. Yeah. So moving here was intentional. So we were I, at, at that time I was um, just married and this is in 2005. Am I getting that right? What are we now? 20, yeah, I, I can never remember. 2020. Dates. 2020. So, yeah, so 2005 we were married and my, my then wife, we were living in London. And we were both actors, both touring actors, both been working for years and years and feeling like we wanted to have kids um, and have a change of life. And my brother had already moved down to St. Leonard's. He'd moved down here in 2004. And so like many, many DFLs, as we're affectionately known, um, it, it was the usual. Came down to visit, walked past an estate agent in the old town, looked at the prices and went, how much? Um, which, of course, you can't do anymore because no. now you look at the prices and you go, how much? In the other way, you know, oh, my God. Uh, yeah, so we moved down, and I think that was the, that was the big, and that was the beginning of my transition from being an actor into uh, developing my training work because we saw, and we opened up a business myself and my, my partner my my ex-wife rachel we opened up a, a business to, in order to support to offer a shop front for all of the local designers and makers mm. 
So it was called McCarran's of Mercatoria, and we were on Norman oh, Road. I remember it well. Yeah, and that was early days, wasn't it? I remember you know? that, yeah. Yeah. Of Mercatoria, yeah. Yeah, and so we, for four years, we, and we had a gallery space out the back, and we, mm. what we did was we, we, so we sold, we stocked um, kind of commercially available items, which were pitched at quite a competitive price mm. point, and we also stocked lots and lots of different locals, designers, and we were able to do that because we had the sort of dual income. Um, so that was great. And so, yeah, I think the context of being here meant we were able to experiment and take the pressure off and try out some different things. And that's when I was, so Rachel was able to kind of spearhead opening the shop. I supported her in that. And then I moved on to um, doing, the, doing the training work. Um, yeah, um, that, so that's, yeah, I do I'm think it's sad relevant. That, the, that that's not there anymore because you've just, that's such nostalgia now. I remember that shop very well. And I yeah, it's it. funny. I we loved uh, it. Oh, uh, you know, I, it's, was, I probably spent a lot of money with you, actually. Yeah, well, we were, <laughs> yeah. We were kind of like, you will remember, we were the only people doing what we were doing. Yeah, you were. Uh, at that time. Otherwise, you'd have to go to Tunbridge Wells or something. Um, so, um, yeah, you were. Yeah. And I was or Brighton. Buckinghamshire. So I came down from Buckinghamshire because my, because my father was very ill, and that's got to be in. 17 odd years ago now I think and um, so I came back down this way and um, 16 yeah maybe 16 years ago um, came back down from growing up around here I'd gone off you know as you do like you said you know we travel all over and we you know find our life and I came back down and for me it was just a wonderful experience because it was so there was so much Gra grassroots stuff happening yeah. and you didn't get that in Buckinghamshire. Buckinghamshire is very refined Cotswolds, you know, um, home counties. It was all very um, branded and everything yeah. was very sorted. And you came, I came back down here and it was just like a, a life changing experience because I could go to places like you say, you know, your shop and, and it was all very grassroots and you were seeing yeah. this. I was like, wow, this blew my mind. And, um, and I had a, 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 so Charlie's 13, so I obviously was just early days pregnant with him very quickly after we arrived. So I spent a lot of time like mooching around Norman Road. <laughs> yeah. Drinking, drinking coffee and, yeah. chatting, and chatting to gallerists because I'd left my gallery behind as I moved down and I'd left that behind in Buckinghamshire. And I, so I was like, these are my people. Ah, uh, and, and that's your street. That's my street. This is yeah. my street. These are my people. And I got to know Lucy Bell at the Photographer's Gallery and Olga yeah. in the Russian Gallery. And yeah. Yeah, no, I had such a lovely, uh, such a nostalgic, thank you. That's made me oh. feel like really nostalgic for that, you know, my first kind of re-emerging into um, this area. I live in Battle, not Hastings, but, you know, as you say, when I was looking for houses, I was like, I don't want to live in France, so let's just keep it back off the country. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. and uh, just a bit so yeah. you know but we're still teased we're still teased by our friends that we we um, we actually live across the channel we're that yeah. far we're that far south that we live across the channel but i love it down here and yeah it yeah. is it is that there is just such a unique energy about this place isn't there that there is i think context is relevant so yes yeah, so you opened um that shop mm. and you started doing your training business and then you had another bit of a life-changing experience yeah so that so i had been up until about five years ago uh, i had been doing more and more training work around uh, resilience for a business so ha this it had started to become a buzzword you know mm. we'd moved through mindfulness, mindfulness and everyone has gone oh, oh my god you got to do some mindfulness and we'd kind of done that we were now into resilience and the, this is this is kind of you know uh, i don't know if it's irony but anyway i came i came back from working away uh, doing a lot of resilience work um and my marriage fell apart like properly spectacularly um anyone who does know me personally knows the story and of course out of res respect to the other parties I, I, I won't say any more but it was sure yeah it, it was yeah. very very messy and I completely and utterly fell apart I mean yeah I felt like I'd been 
physically beaten up you know it was uh, I'm, i was talking to a friend about this yesterday it was it was visceral the whole experience i can kind of feel your energy isn't that so that just validates the energy coming through even when we're remotely like this I, yeah my head, my head now is tingling and i'm feeling the energy of that pain yeah Bizarre. yeah it was it was extraordinary and i the I, I i listened again and again to this song by john grant um, which I'm going to misquote it, so apologies to the John Grant fans. But it's 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 the line is something like this: pain is like a glacier leaving behind an extraordinarily landscape. That's the sort of thing, and it really felt like a, that, a glacier just and it's grief Cuts effectively what I was yeah. experiencing, just ripping through you. But you know, try and stop a glacier in its tracks. You know. You can't. Mm -mm. Um, and you know that when that's got passed through you, you will have you'll have a beautiful, extraordinary valley with diverse nature and water and trees. And so actually it's like it's kind of like just stick with it, it's worth it. Boy, does it hurt right now, because you're kind of I felt like this glacier was ripping through my chest, you know, it was like ripping me apart. Um so so part of me was going, Well, oh, this is interesting. Let's see if all this resilience terminology and Still theory works. <laughs> works yeah let's put it to the test because of course you know you can't put things to the test until you've got a real life situation so Absolutely. i i did put it to the test and over i would say a very tricky six months um again a bit like the i'll do it 12 year olds in in going to france i'm very much like right let's do this let's bring it on if i'm going to feel this pain do you know what i'd really prefer to get it over and done with so let's go for it you know um rip the plaster off uh, met, met a fantastic counselor who's moved out of the area but he was amazing um so did some sessions with him um uh, and I, when i started to feel like i was coming out the other side i realized something and this is what brought me specifically to this point today i realized that the um the the techniques and the theory had helped, but actually what had really worked was something else. Um, what had really worked was what had happened when I wasn't trying. And what had really worked was when I allowed myself do what somewhere deep down inside I knew was the right thing to do. When I trusted in that, um, I knew the right thing to do. I knew how to be, I knew um, I had trust and faith and, and I felt ultimately that I was safe and that um, I'd had a huge shock. And so that got me really interested. I thought, okay, so this is interesting. What is that? What's all that about? And that's where the notion, the concept of everyday resilience is born from, is, is to sit, a, 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 I'd say, alongside or underneath traditional resilience training. So more psychological more psychology-based training. So a lot of the, pretty much all of the research I've come across and studied has been, um, yeah, psychological mm -hmm. research. And I've been interested in exploring what happens beyond psychology. So what happens when you blend psychology and spirituality, if you like. So that's what everyday resilience is, is about for me, is about trying to integrate those practices, those psychological theories, and, um, but integrate them into it within a bigger picture. So they, they sit supported by a, a spiritual understanding and faith that goes beyond words and theories and goes beyond what's happening up there. Yeah, um, it's what it's what happens when you. Thoughts, are we? Yeah, well, we're, and that, and we're in, more in, than that. We are. We absolutely are. We are more than that. And it was so lovely at the beginning of the call we had the other night. Mm. Um, one of the participants said, "Oh, such and such, such and such," and I just did that without thinking. And so I was like, isn't that interesting? It's, yeah. it's the things we do without thinking it, that, yeah. in a good way. Um, yeah. And quite often our, our, our thinking is what gets in the way. Our thinking is what gets in the way and prevents us from. So when we think about trust, we spent a lot of time talking about trust, um, you know, trusting ourselves. So, you know, if you accept that you have everything that you need already inside of you, that you are innately well, and that nothing can take that away from you. You are enough. Uh, why doesn't it feel like that all the time? Well, it doesn't feel like that all the time because we don't trust in it. Um, why don't we? Why do we not trust in it? We don't trust in it because 
there's, we're thinking things, there's beliefs and unconscious stuff going on up there that is getting in the way. So that's the work we do, isn't it? The work we do is, is how to kind of get past those, to allow those thoughts and that thinking to exist uh, but not to be swept up and caught up and driven by it, if you like, not to be controlled by it, or um, to to integrate it and to to live with it. I love that idea. I love that blended approach. You know, mm. as you say, you know, we've been through the mindfulness and we've been through the I need the science and you know and all of yeah. that. Yeah, I love this concept, and I think that's something that you know definitely I bring to my practice as well. Is that blended approach of the head the hands the doing and the, but yeah. the heart and the heart and yeah. trusting yourself so you know we are complex creatures yeah. living in a complex context yeah if we can um align ourselves to what is right within our heart and then consciously think the thoughts and do and trust yeah in the process we're starting to enlighten, we're starting to evolve into yeah. being able to make the decisions that we uh, to get the life that we want to have, whatever that looks like. And that life yeah. that you want won't be the same as you've you know, you've you've described a very complex life there, um, that you know, you've learnt along the way. Mm. The answer is to learn, isn't it? Is to just dwell. And yeah. Allow ourselves the dwelling time and the reflection time to go. Okay, I'm just about to take a break because this is the season finale, and that's my dwelling time. It's like I'm going to now just dwell on what that means. What What does that all mean? Like your yeah. glacier, I kind of see COVID as being a bit like a glacier. It is. Yeah. We couldn't stop it. What can we? We've all experienced it. It's a bit like grief. It is. Now, when we sit there quietly and give ourselves a period of reflection what do we hear what do we feel what do we see accepting that we are not just a seeing thing or just a hearing thing or just, we're a blended you know you hear that word mm. blended family don't you a blended yeah. family well we're blended as humans so where do you think the future is? Where do you where do you think um, as lockdown eases a bit? But I think you know we're in this for the long haul. We're in this for the next couple of years, if not longer. You know, re reassessing. You know how we how we live. Where do where do you see us going? And and what are you doing? What are you focusing on? Well, my my hope would be uh, that this what we're all going through has offered us the offered all of us the opportunity to do what you're talking about, to stop, to reflect, mm -hmm. and to, my favorite word, to notice. You talked about notice. noticing earlier. To notice what's going on and to notice that our attention, which has been, for most of us, traditionally caught up all the time in the outside world. So our focus is very external. And to notice that actually there is something else at play, which is called you living your life that's that's going on it's like oh hang on i'm actually living my life how much how connected am i with that i'm most of us are really disconnected with our we feel disconnected with ourselves we don't live in an awareness of the of the connection with ourselves our our attention is going one direction so what i would love to see is uh it is folks haven't taken the opportunity to, as you say, to blend, to be able to do both. So yes, to go back and interact with life and get busy connecting with other human beings, because that's uh, really difficult for us all at the moment, not being allowed to connect. But to do that in a, with, um, with a two-way mirror almost, you know, with an awareness and a connection to oneself. So we don't find ourselves lost all, all the time that we're we're we stay closer to home um home being you know our, our natural state of wellness and that that actually gives us um more freedom freedom from uh negative emo too many negative emotions so freedom from too much fear and anxiety um because a lot of that negative emotion that we experience is self-generated and some of it isn't some of it is a response to you know excuse my language but shit happens as you know you're we are of course it's normal to feel 
things. Um, but it's how we feel about what we feel is the difficult thing. That's when we add things on, isn't it? You know, yeah, it's the secondary that, layer. Yeah, is that someone else's feelings that we're bringing to that? Are we bringing meaning to that that we don't need to bring? Yeah, so, what are we adding? Yeah. What are we adding on top yeah. that we don't need to? Yeah, as you say, you know, I'm very much aware that before we went into lockdown, I was feeling very overwhelmed. Yeah. And I was completely responsible for that. Yeah. But I was not accepting that I was completely responsible for that. And, you know, I'm, I've had time to think over this time and, you know, now go into a period of re reflection. I think it's really important to give yeah. ourselves breaks and time and to meditate and to walk in nature. Yeah. And just to think, how did, how did that feel? And what would I, what would I, what have I learned from that? What do I yeah. notice? from that experience my um the counselor i worked with one of the things i loved about him was he did what you were talking he blended so he he one minute he'd be talking about Taoism, the next thing he'd be talking about transaction analysis and one of the things he mentioned was gestalt CBT. <laughs> yeah a bit of like kind of everything which was great um because it was just whatever worked but he talked to me about a concept that i hadn't heard of before called the fertile void which i think comes from gestalt therapy and it's just it was so powerful for me. And the principle of this is, as I've understood it, forgive the Gestalt experts out there, you can correct me, but as I've understood it is, it's the equivalent of winter. It's the period of not knowing. Mm -hmm. It's the period of letting go and of waiting. Um, and he, he was saying that to me in terms of, you know, right now, you're so the fertile void yeah there, you're what you've experienced it's not now is not the time to get on your horse and gallop off into the, the you know now is the time for you to stop and be with whatever it is you need to be with and experience whatever you need to experience and to use my other metaphor to allow that glacier glacier to pass through you actually mm -hmm. that's what is and see what comes see what that valley looks like see what that extraordinary mm -hmm. landscape looks like and you won't know and nature does that nature has that in built in the seasons mm. you know but we are we get caught up in it's like we want the lights on all the time isn't it we keep go 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 and we don't allow ourselves that time of that out breath that time of holding so of right, pausing of, you, know, the, you know nature gives us the seasons but we're disrespecting nature we're completely yeah and we end up burnt out um yeah and i, lo I love what you say about there's taking responsibility for that, but with compassion. So yeah. it's very different, isn't it, to blaming yourself. It's not about blaming yourself, but it's so liberating to go, actually, I have made a series of choices, unconsciously or consciously, which have led me to be in these circumstances. Mm -hmm. And that means I can make some different choices. Yeah. Um, and I won't necessarily be in these same circumstances. Yeah, compassion for yourself, kindness. Mm. You know, in a world where you can be everything, and have a t-shirt. <laughs> in a world where you can be everything, be kind, but especially self-love, love, love self. yourself. It's so true. And, and and be kind to yourself because, you know, if you don't love yourself, you know, then the energy you're giving out is, is going to be jagged and is not going to be um, useful to you. You have yeah. to, you know, most importantly, love yourself. We are given this one life in... Um, to use it well. I hate the expression living my best life because none of us can do that at any, you know, all the time. But yeah. we can be kind to ourselves and say, I did the best I could at that particular moment. Yeah. The sound has gone. Uh, I'm hoping that everybody else can hear us. <laughs> can you hear? You can hear me. So it might just be Julia's sound. Um, so, um, so Julia would like to ask, um, Justin would like to ask yeah. whether Justin has worked with young people with special difficulties, e.g. autism, and what he has learned from them. Oh, so other people can hear us, so it's probably is just sometimes that happens yeah. with people's sound. So have you worked with people with special needs and autism, etc.? As, as a resilience coach, I haven't. Um, but what I would say is I'm really interested in the area of, broadly speaking, what we might term mental health. And I mean in, in a huge sense, because coming at mental health from a spiritual perspective uh, is, a, is a slightly different take from a psychological perspective. Um, and so 
I yeah. So um so you I'm, haven't, but you would be interested in doing so. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, and and, and it's a constant. Uh, so it's a constant area of of interest, and it comes up all all the time. I think when you have these kind of discussions. Um, yeah. So now we can bring what we do, which we do for a certain set of people, and mm. make that. You know, that's always the dream, isn't it? That you know, you can only help one person at a time. But if you can yeah. keep moving that forward and people who are really, really in need. I mean, I have a few clients who have um, disabilities, whether they're mental or physical. And, um, you know, all of this stuff helps. Yeah. Um, talking, talking, you know, as Freud said, you know, we suffer from our memories, don't we? And so talking helps. That, and there's a spectrum and the blended approach of spirituality and psychology and cbt and hate nlp etc if you can bring all of those into a package yeah um, so collaboration with <clears throat> other people with other skills so um that you can help the maximum amount of people because you can go oh what i have as an nlp or a coach or a professional development within the creatives i haven't got the skill set for you right now yeah but actually someone who's done cbt or has done um what was uh the girl from Egg Tooth, uh, Laura, was saying, Laura. Was, yeah, she was saying there was another set of therapies. She actually told me to get this book, The Body Keeps the Score, and I would really recommend it. I've been reading it, and Ted has been eating the pages as we go. Very good. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> He's been eating them, and I'm trying to read ahead of him so that he doesn't re eat the pages. Before yeah, he keeps <laughs> keeps you uh, on, on point. Keeps, keeps me moving. But that that's a fabulous book. And, yeah. Um, it's all about the... Um, psychology and um the advance of science to help people with post-traumatic stress disorder and i have learned so much and i've done yeah. a lot of education but i've learned a lot from reading that book and i would definitely recommend people if they are interested in yeah. this field yeah to read that book it's the mind brain body and the transformation of trauma and trauma doesn't just look like what we think you know war yeah. and famine. trauma looks like being bullied or being talked down to and belittled it it looks like being abused in your family setting it's anything that mm. caused it like the trauma that you went through with your yeah with your that, was, that was traumatic yeah mm. yeah this this I, th I think this is i haven't read the book but it sounds to me like it's part of um this theory of embodied cognition mm. which is this theory that you know, we, the mistake we make is that we separate ourselves out into these different boxes. And so that's why I would be cautious about talking about mental health personally per se, because I, I think we have, we have health. Um, and Absolutely. in some ways, when we start to separate things out, it's, it's, that's helpful for, from a sort of diagnostic perspective, but from a, a treatment perspective, we need to treat the, uh, the whole. You know? Exactly. It doesn't yeah. really matter when people come to me, you know, I'm going in from a, you know, a, a whole and I'm taking all of that blended of all of the experience yeah. and life experience. I know, you know, I suffered a massive grief when losing my father when I was mm. quite young and he was diagnosed with a life limiting illness that then went on for 20 years, which was very traumatic. Mm. But I learned so much about myself during that period. And that led me to my um, journey of education and self discovery. And we are we're a whole and I'm not just that experience. I'm not yeah. just a mother. I'm not just a coach. I you know, we are this complex blend of everything. And we need to, you know, accept that. We're yeah when you're working with people as well. I mean, I'm not a doctor. Yes. So I don't yeah. diagnose. No. I, I so I would work with. Yeah, I'd, I'd say I, I work with people up to the, the, the border of where what they're experiencing is preventing them from functioning. So that, and that's quite wide. So there's a big overlap. You know, someone said to me once, well, what, you know, what are you, you, are you a counselor are you a psychotherapist are you a coach are you and i said well i'm none of those things but there's a bit of all of those things in what i do but i will do it to a point where you know if you're broadly speaking functioning yeah. then we can work together and what's interesting is how one of the things that comes up quite a lot is actually helping people accept the, their quirks 
yeah. and say, that, you don't need to fix that. That's fine. It says who? I, I asked, I mean, you, you probably do this as well. I love that question that coach was just says who, you know, people come out with something and you go, well, says who? And it's great. Cause they go, well, well, Oh, Set my when Set, I yeah, <laughs> maybe exactly. Or, exactly. Yeah. And you, and when, when you give people that freedom, it's like, all oh, right, I don't have to, I don't, gosh, yeah, actually I'm operating on this principle that first of all, who knows where it came from? I've acquired it somewhere. And secondly, I don't even agree with it as a principle. So, geez, you know, that's crazy. Um, so a lot of people, so this notion of there being normal behavior and abnormal behavior, I don't, I don't buy at all, you know. And I, you know, I, I love eccentrics. I've always loved eccentrics. Uh, Good, because eccentrics I'm for me eccentric. are eccentric. <laughs> yeah, but eccentrics are people who are just comfortable with their weirdness. Yeah. Um, yeah. People who aren't comfortable with their weirdness are the ones who are who are suffering actually because they're trying to hide them or deny it or deal with it or or you know medicate for it somehow whether you know anesthetize themselves to the that experience. So, but actually, you know, we are broader and bigger and stronger than we give ourselves credit credit for massively trust yourself to be yeah. yourself yeah be yourself and if people don't gravitate to you or don't like you that's okay it's fine that's absolutely fine because you're enough yeah you're enough and the right people will gravitate towards you based yeah. on your energy if you try and be something you're not that's exhausting yeah totally yeah. exhausting and you know i've done it i've had to do that in a corporate environment i've had to be you know, this doesn't work in a corporate environment. Yeah. It really doesn't. I am yeah. way too difficult in a corporate environment. And I tried it really hard um, yeah. to fit in. And it made me depressed and miserable yeah. as a human outside of the, you know, I was very successful in the job because I had intelligence enough to morph myself into something they wanted to see and yeah. work with. But outside, at home, I was depressed, miserable. And I knew I had to kind of stop doing that. Yeah. And that's the thing, isn't it? It's like, look for the joy. I, was, I had to stop doing that to myself. That was abuse. And I had to yeah. stop it. I was abusing myself. And I just am me. And if you don't like it, that's absolutely fine. I don't need you to like me. And how did you, how did you recognize that then, Leslie? About the fact that I was trying to be someone I wasn't. Yeah. Well, I think that thing about, you know, you're told what, what career are you going to have? And you, and you get into this thing of, you know, I was offered a job in a bank as a Saturday job. And I just carried, and I was meant to be going to art school. And I just carried on doing it because yeah. I fell in with a group of people that I really enjoyed um, at, the, at the place of work. And I was having good fun with them. Yeah. But the actual work was killing me. It was, a, yeah. it was so destroying. The problem was I was really good at it. I could make myself really good at it. And so therefore they were going, you're really, you're really good at this. We'll give you mm. some more money and a promotion. And you're like, okay, they're telling me I'm really good at it. I've got to keep doing it. Yeah. But I'm going home and I'm really miserable because my soul is a creative and is someone who's gregarious and eccentric and lively. And I'm having to be quiet and yeah. studious and fit myself. And then they're going, you're really good at this. And so you get, tr it's a trap. Yeah. It's the money trap. And what and was this? The ego trap. Yeah. And, but, but what was it? I'm interested to know what, what was the point that you noticed that that's what you were doing with your life? How, how did you recognize, oh, actually, I, I want to make some changes here. My this father isn't... was diagnosed with um, okay. Parkinson's when I okay. was... Um, 23 mm -hmm. and all of a sudden my life came into stark um contrast of this isn't uh you know when you're young you think you're going to live forever yeah and there isn't a limit on it and then all of a sudden my parent someone who i absolutely adored and my entire world was you know based around i was told was going to die mm -hmm. didn't know when but it was going to happen mm. because he had it early onset and it was very severe and he went from being this really gregarious, like me, outgoing, everyone knew him, everyone loved him, mm. person, to this mm. person that shriveled literally within a week in front of my face.
Mm. And, and it made me stop and it made me mm. think. And um, I think, you know, I've talked about this on previous broadcasts. I was sent for this therapy called, um, at the time it was called relaxation therapy, but I think would now be described as Reiki or something alternative therapy mm. by the bank that I was working for because they knew I was unwell and this was, you know, I was mm. in grief and shock, I was mm. suffering from trauma. And that made me stop and really reflect and tune into my body and my feelings. And, you know, she would say, right, you know, go from the t your toes right through your body. How does it feel? Flex, relax. How does that feel now? And she made me reconnect with my body and mm. how I was physically feeling. Mm. That was profound for a 23-year-old who had no, had, had no real awareness training or an upbringing that would have made me tune in. And then they sent me for counselling. I realized mm. talking therapy was useless for me. Didn't work for me. Mm. But this body therapy worked really well. Mm. And so I stopped and that's when I took a year off and I really kind of um, looked into myself and reflected a lot and really thought about what I wanted to do. And then I, I thought, well, I need to kind of, and I didn't know there were other things I could do. So I thought, oh, I need to get back in the workplace, you know. Mm. And so I took this job, at, um, first of all, for a marketing company that then led into Coca-Cola. And I realised, I was after a couple of years, I realised I was sleepwalking back into the old way. Uh, yes. And I was like, this is silly. You're sleepwalking yourself back into where you know is unhappiness. Because I'd done enough reflection by that point that I was in tune with how it felt in my body. Yeah. And I'm like, you're sleepwalking yourself straight back in there. And so, you know, I'm very lucky. I had a very supportive partner and, um, mm. you know, he was very aware of how this was affecting me physically and mentally. And so we agreed that I would stop. So I resigned and they were mortified and they were like, you can't leave. You can't, you're really good at this. Yeah. The ego thing comes back in. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, but I've done that. I know that you can ego me into this and, you know, flatter me into doing something that I know would be wrong for me. So I went back to college and I did my photography degree and then I started doing that and I kind of, then I opened a gallery and yeah, the rest yeah. is history. I kind of yeah. went on this journey of enlightenment that led me to doing a master's degree and NLP training and coaching training. And for me, I'm, a, I'm an evolutionary beast. I'm continuing to, ev continually learning. And these broadcasts have been a learning. I've interacted with people, I've learned so much. So it's, thank you so much. It's so interesting. Thank you for. I'm, I'm sorry I forced you to go through all no, of that that's again. Fine. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> it's I haven't fine. heard that story, but it's really interesting for me uh, that how much energy we spend trying to avoid um, discomfort and failure, and actually that's when we really learn and when we really grow, isn't it? It's it's just so fascinating. So you know we talk about post traumatic stress, but you know, the, the vast majority of us experience post-traumatic growth um, when, when we go through tough times. Um, it's really, that's really interesting. I describe you know. myself as a sufferer of post-traumatic growth. That's what I, that's how I describe it. When people ask me, I often say, I am a sufferer of post-traumatic growth. When I've had a trauma, I have grown. So now I'm a slight addict to moments of trauma and things going kind of wrong. I mean, you know, when COVID happened, yeah. you know, I had that little meltdown and I was like, actually, I know this. This is yeah. my people. These are my people. Yeah. When things kind of go wrong, this is my moment. Yeah. And I can grow now. This has given me an opportunity to grow. Yeah. And, you know, that's amazing. You don't have to have trauma, though, anyone who's watching. You don't yeah. have to have trauma to do that. You yeah. can go, I can create a moment of growth a moment of learning you can create for yourself at any time. Yeah. You don't have to have the trauma. You don't have to have the marriage breakdown or the father dying. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know, you don't have to have that. You don't really have to go to the edge. I've gone to the edge. You went to the edge. Yeah. You know, and looked over. I literally looked into that void and um, gave it a really good stare. Mm. You don't have to do that. You can no. do that. You can buy giving yourself a moment in time and reflecting and really, you know, closing your eyes, turning off some senses and looking in. Meditation is great for that. It's right, it's right there all the time. Yeah. We just need to just turn the volume down, don't we, for a moment and it's like, ah, there I am. Oh. Exactly. Turn the volume down.
volume down, turn off some of the senses so you can truly hear yourself. Mm. And I think that is an amazing end to what this season mm. one mm. has been about. It's been about finding ourselves. It's been about mm. the journey. Mm. I'm so grateful to you, Justin. That's been an amazing session. Thank and, you. And I've really enjoyed it. I hope I know everybody else has enjoyed it. I can see comments on all platforms saying how much they've enjoyed it. Brilliant. And um, this has been the perfect end because it just shows that if you just take a moment, <laughs> turn off some of your senses, mm. and just give yourself time to reconnect with the self. Yeah. You'll find the true way forward, the right yeah. way for you. Yeah. Beautiful. So thank you, everyone. We will thank be you. back in September with Art360. That's going to be a bit of a journey. That's going to be live from artist studios every day. And um, I'm excited for that because that's, you know, something completely different. No one's ever done this before. So, yeah, we're being brave. We've found some resilience and we're looking in the void again. Yeah. <laughs> and okay. then we'll be, yeah, woo. <laughs> that's quite <clears throat> deep down there we're <clears throat> gonna give it we're gonna just jump in and see how it goes and learn as we go and yeah. then we will be back in october for season two and i hope justin you will come back with great pleasure chat to us in season two and let us know how the new normal looks for you and how everything's going sure thing with pleasure thank you thank you everyone who's joined us throughout this season i know there's been tens of thousands of you um it's been a joy and a privilege it really has. And uh, I'm going to go now and lay down in a dark room <laughs> and do a little bit of meditating. <laughs> Just reconnect with self. Marvellous. <laughs> I think I need to do. Reset. Love, reset. Love to Cathy. And, Thank um, you. And, yeah. and if anyone wants to um, connect with Justin, as I say, it's at the bottom of the screen here and it'll be on all the, it's on all of the um, social media that we've put out. Fabulous. Thank you all very much. And uh, yeah, see you all in September and see you very soon, Justin. I'm sure we'll go on a dog walk or something. Definitely. Let's soon. book that in. Brilliant. All right. Take care, everyone. Take care now. Bye for now. Thanks.